Hello, everyone, and welcome to phyloseminar.org. The current theme is phylogenetic networks, which generalize trees by allowing loops in the graph. In this series of three talks, we are hearing three perspectives on networks. First, we heard from Luai Nakle on statistical inference of phylogenetic networks from multilocus data. Today, we'll hear from Celine Skornavaka on parsimony methods in phylogenetic network reconstruction. In December, Cecile NA will describe challenges in network inference, as well as how one can use networks in phylogenetic comparative methods. Please remember that the Q&A app is gone now, so you can ask questions through Twitter or IRC, as described on the attending section of the Phyloseminar website. As I mentioned, today's speaker is Celine Skornavaka. After a master's degree in mathematical engineering at the University of Rome II, Celine moved into bioinformatics and obtained her PhD in computer science at University of Montpellier in 2009. She then did a postdoctoral fellowship for two years at the University of Tübingen joined uh, the Institute of Evolutionary Studies in Montpellier as a researcher at CNRS in October 2011, where she continues to this day. Welcome, Celine, and thanks for participating. So thank you very much, Eric, for the introduction. So today's talk is going to be about the parsimony method in phylogenetic network uh, reconstruction. So I'll start by briefly introducing some of the concepts that uh, Luhai already discussed in the last uh, final seminar to make the, the talk self-contained, but uh, I really strongly advise to listen to his uh, field of seminar because he did a terrific uh, work at introducing our field. So why we use phylogenetic network? We use phylogenetic network uh, because uh, trees are not suited uh, to represent evolution when inheritance uh, from multiple ancestors is present uh, in, in species. Example of uh, such circumstances are, for example, hybrid speciation or horizontal gene transfer, or uh, again, uh, some recombination events. So what is an explicit phylogenetic network is uh, a DAG, so a direct cyclic graph that is uh, rooted and uh, where the leaves are labeled by species. And the word explicit is used to denote the, that reticulate nodes, so nodes that have uh, multiple ancestors, so V3 here in this uh, example, they're used to depict uh, actual reticulate events, so hybridization, recombination, etc. And on the contrary, we use the word abstract to uh, denote phylogenetic network uh, where we depict a conflict uh, in the data. But where the reticulation nodes, they don't have an evolutionary meaning. So for example, if we have a split uh, network that are built using a uh, split tree, then we cannot just point to a node and say, oh, this node is a hybridization event, because this is not uh, the meaning of, uh, of the nodes uh, here. So in Luai's, uh, Luai's talk focused on statistical methods, so here I'll focus on the parsimony method. And uh, the main hypothesis of this kind of method is that changes are not so frequent, so uh, among the competing uh, hypotheses, we should prefer the, the simplest one. So in this talk, I'll, uh, I'll show two ways of implementing the, this concept of uh, parsimony in uh, phylogenetic network reconstruction. So we uh, introduce a way of combining combinatorial objects while minimizing the complexity of, of the resulting network. And then I will move uh, to showing how to minimize evolutionary changes via some sequence pace uh, for parsimony method that, that have uh, a flavor that is similar to the Fitch parsimony uh, on trees. So I'll start with what I call a parsimony uh, combinatorial method in phylogenetic network uh, reconstruction. And they actually, they all uh, have an underlying uh, approach that is common. So first, we construct uh, from the data, for example, alignment, some combinatorial objects uh, such as uh, trees, cluster, or tree nets. And then we combine uh, this object into an explicit phylogenetic network. And the object we combine, the way that we combine them in the parameters that we optimize, they give a, a large spectrum of uh, different problems. So there are two parameters that I'm going to, to talk about uh, in this talk. It's going to be this, uh, the hybridization number, also called the, the reticulation number, that is simply the number of reticulation of a network. So here, for example, in this network, we have one, two, three, four, and five reticulations. So the reticulation number of this network is five. And then we have also the parameters called the level, that is simply the maximum number of reticulation in each biconetic component. So here again, in this uh, example, we have a three biconetic component. In the first one, we have two reticulation. In the second one, reticulation. And the third one has two reticulation. So the uh, level of this network is, uh, is two. 
So I'll use the, the concept of level and hybridization number a lot in, the, in, in this talk. And another concept that is going to be seen, uh, central in this uh, talk is the concept of a tree displayed by the network. So when we have a reticulation event, uh, we have the branches, they converge to give rise to a new lineage. And the, the genome at the start of the new lineage is a composition of those of the parent lineage. So for example, here, uh, the green uh, genome and the violet genome give a, uh, a composite uh, genome that is partially green and partially violet. And if we look at the evolution of each part that uh, is independently inherited, then this part is best described by, by a gene tree. So if we follow, for example, the part uh, of the, the green segment, then we get the, the gene tree that is putting DNA together, you can see here. And if we do the same for the violet part, we get the gene tree putting E and F together. So actually, when I use the word gene tree, uh, the word gene is just a, like a, a shortcut for non-recombinant region. So it can be an exon, it can be several gene, it's just non-recombinant region. So we will see in the second part of the talk that this model uh, has its limit because uh, it does not uh, model ILS and allopolyploidy, but it's actually a good approximation of a certain situation. So we will stick with that <clears throat> in the first part of the talk and we move forward something else in the second part of the talk. Uh, so if we want to see in, uh, trees that are displayed by a network. A, a way of, uh, of doing it is do the switch on and switch off trick. So what we do is that for each recombination, we switch on one of the edge and we switch off the other one. And we do it for all uh, reticulation of the network and all possible way uh, to do that. And what we do is that uh, in the second step, we delete the switch on, uh, switch off edges and uh, they are label leaves, so leaves that are hanging without label, and we also suppress uh, the resulting node that have a degree uh, in, in degree one. And once we have this, uh, we have done this, we have the tree displayed by the network. If we do that for all possible switch on and switch off uh, possibility, we have all the trees displayed by the network, and we are actually, we can have a two to the R possible tree, where R is uh, the number uh, of uh, a reticulation uh, in, in the network. And I think that the, the most known and studied uh, of the combinatorial method for phylogenetic network reconstruction is, is probably the hybridization number problem that I stated in this slide. So we are given two rooted binary tree uh, on the same taxon set by different topology. And what we look for is the most probable evolutionary history under the assumption that the we are in the parsimony framework, and the all differences uh, between the two trees are caused by hybridization. So mathematically, what we are looking for is a phylogenetic network that displays both trees uh, that has a minimal number of, uh, of hybridization or reticulation nodes. I use both terms uh, interchangeably. And this is what we call a hybridization network. And to solve this, this problem, we often use uh, the agreement forest uh, model. So an agreement forest uh, is like, roughly speaking, it's just uh, the result of chopping the two trees into subtrees, such that uh, each uh, uh, subtree is a restricted subtree of T1 and T2. And when I say restricted subtree, it's just uh, that the, this subtree agrees with the, both T1 and T2. So here, for example, we may ask, if this small subtree is a restricted subtree of the tree here, T. And if we focus on the label BCD here, and we restrict our attention to this, we actually have the topology of T restricted to BCD is different from the topology of the, the subtree. So actually, the subtree is not a restricted subtree uh, of T. It can't be uh, part of an agreement forest uh, for T. And this, the second constraint that we have is that the tree have to be not disjoint, pairwise not disjoint. So here we have two subtree, and these two subtree, they are not not disjoint. Here actually, they share these two nodes. So they can't be part of an agreement forced uh, for, uh, for the tree T. And why we ask a not disjoint subtree is actually because as soon as we don't have a, a not disjoint subtree. We have a multiple allele that are going in the in the branch of the network, and in this in this model we can only have one allele per uh, branch of, of the network. So this is why we ask not disjoint subtree. 
And this is a positive example to finish with something positive. Positive. So if we have a T1 and T2 here, we can see that uh, this uh, set of components is um, is an agreement forest for uh, our two trees because uh, if we restrict uh, uh, the trees uh, to the set uh, of labels of the components, so AD here, AD here, or EF and row here, we actually have the same uh, topology that uh, in, the, uh, in the set of components, and it's easy to see that they also are not disjoint. So this is an agreement for us to, um, uh, for these two trees, but we are uh, actually in our model, we focus on a subcategory of agreement forest that is called an, an acyclic agreement forest. So uh, suppose that we have T1 and T2 again and an agreement forest uh, for these two trees. So what we do is that we construct something that is called inheritance graph. And this inheritance graph, it's a, it's a graph that has a, a node for each component. So uh, see one, two, three, and four, we have four components. And we add an edge, directed edge between two components. If the root of the first component is an ancestor of the root of the second component uh, in one of the two trees. So for example, here we have uh, the root of C2, AD is that one. And it's an ancestor of both B and C. And this is why we added these two uh, edges. And if you look at the root of the, the component C1, it's here, it's the root of T2, and is uh, obviously an ancestor of all other uh, root of the component. So this is why we added these uh, three uh, edges. And as soon as uh, we have this, this inheritance graph, it's a cyclic, we have uh, an acyclic agreement forest. And in this model, we ask this uh, cyclic uh, cyclicity of the inheritance graph because uh, this permits us to uh, not have cycle in uh, directed cycle in the uh, in the network, where so we saw a, a, a rooted phylogenetic network is a, a DAG, so a directed uh, cyclic graph. So we need to to have this uh, inheritance graph to be a, a cyclic. And we call a maximum acyclic agreement forest that we also call MAF, uh, any acyclic agreement forest of uh, minimal size. And um, we are uh, actually interested in this MAF because uh, uh, we can use MAF to construct a hybridization network. And we do that by gluing together again uh, the component of, uh, of the, 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 the MAF into a, an hybridization network. So how we do that, we start with uh, the component that has uh, the, the row. The row is a placeholder for, uh, for the root. And uh, then we add the, the second component, uh, and we attach it such that the topology of, of the first tree is, uh, is satisfied. So here you see that uh, the, the, the sister clade of ABD is EF, and this is why we added this uh, edge. And then we add an edge to satisfy the topology of the, the second tree. So here we have uh, the same component and the sister clade this time is F. This is why we got this edge. And we continue adding uh, uh, the component to the, to, the, to, the, to the network and we get at the end, by gluing together the math, an hybridization network for the, for the two trees. So this problem has been like studied uh, a lot, and uh, the problem is actually NPR. It means that there is no polynomial algorithm unless p is equal NP. But on the positive side, we have that this uh, is FPT in the reticulation number. So FPT means fixed parameter tractable, and uh, so the idea of this running time for people that don't, are not very familiar with the complexity is that. Uh, the, the running time is growing linearly in the number of species, and the, the complexity uh, explosion is confined in the parameter R. So if we have a lot of species, but uh, the resulting hybridization ne network has a, a reticulation number that is uh, low, then the running time is, is going to be pretty good. And we were also able to, to prove that uh, um, this problem is FPT in the level of the network. So we saw that the level is always uh, smaller uh, or equal to the reticulation number. It's often way smaller than a reticulation number, so it, it's pretty good news. We, we got a like, pretty fast algorithm when the, the level is uh, it's more, it's low. And this FPT algorithm, they have been uh, shown to be FPT thanks to three the reduction step. 
So the first reduction uh, is the subtree reduction, and it's pretty easy to explain. So as soon as we have uh, that the two trees have exactly the same uh, subtree, so we, we have the two isomorphic subtree that are present in both trees, then we can shrink them uh, into a, a leaf. For example, here we can shrink these guys, and then these guys, and then these guys, and then these guys. So we can have like a, a big uh, 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 trees and shrink it to to four uh, leaves tree. So it's, it's pretty powerful reduction. Then we have uh, the chain reduction that uh, tells that uh, if we have a caterpillar chain that is the same in the in the in the in both tree, but is actually connected in a different way. Here we have A, here G. So we can't use the subtree reduction. Then uh, we can prove that uh, this chain is either completely recovered in the in the phylogenetic uh, the resulting phylogenetic network, or is completely shattered. And this also uh, permit us to reduce the, the size of the problem. And then the, the last one is called the cluster reduction. And the cluster reduction say that uh, if you have uh, like a clade of uh, uh, inside the, the two trees, uh, where actually the subtree, they are not exactly the same. You see the topology here is, is not the same in the two trees, so we can't use the subtree reduction. But uh, since it's the same clade in both trees, then we can actually detach uh, the two subtree, solve uh, the, the math problem uh, separately, and then attach the, the math to the, the global math um, that we recovered uh, uh, afterwards. And uh, so this is uh, the, the idea of uh, how often maths are uh, reconstructed. So we start by uh, having two trees. We reduce uh, this, uh, this problem into sub-problem using this reduction step that I just mentioned. And then we solve this uh, sub-problem uh, having uh, uh, an algorithm with an exponential running time and we get the math that we can attach back to uh, recover hybridization network as I showed uh, previously. So uh, this is like it's the overall idea of uh, lots of, uh, of the algorithm that permit to uh, reconstruct hybridization network. And they, they are pretty fast, but if the level goes up, so you, if you have uh, like a very complex uh, hybridization network uh, coming out of, of your analysis, then the running time can be like extremely slow. And this is why we actually turn ourselves to approximation algorithm. And uh, there is an algorithm that I'm, I'm pretty proud of because it, it's, it's, I think it's really uh, elegant, and it's the this uh, D uh, C plus one uh, approximation algorithm. And the idea is pretty simple. So if we want to have an acyclic uh, agreement forest, uh, we can decompose the, the problem of finding one in the problem of finding an agreement forest, and then get the, this inheritance graph that I showed you before, and try to make uh, this uh, the inheritance graph acyclic. And we do that uh, via another problem. It's called the direct feedback vertex set problem, DFVS. And uh, so we, we were able to prove that uh, as soon as you have a C approximation for the agreement for this problem and a D approximation for D FVS problem, then you can get a D C plus one approximation for our problem. And this uh, permit us to um, to run uh, on my computer. It's like a, it's not an awesome computer uh, to construct network with up to ten thousand leaves and and to ten thousand replication within ten minutes. And the, the idea is that we use a three approximation for the agreement forest problem that's pretty known, and we solved exactly. Uh, the direct uh, vertex uh, feedback set, I always mix them up. Uh, because uh, actually, uh, we in our instances, uh, the, the, the inheritance graph, they are highly uh, acyclic already, so it's fast to, to solve them. Um, so uh, this shows that uh, we can actually uh, now solve the problem of idealization network for uh, for big instance, and what I would like also to, to mention is that uh, the the community is actually turning to a more biologically relevant scenario. So it's moving to try to find idealization network for more than two trees, for non-binary trees, for trees with a different taxon set. So uh, we are actually starting to be able to solve a more biologically relevant uh, scenario. 
So uh, this is really good. And I would just like to mention like three software that can be used that are already uh, available. So you can just plug your uh, your trees and uh, they will give you the uh, the habitation network for your your bunch of trees. So uh, I suggest you to give it a try if you if you need to uh, to reconstruct the network from trees. But uh, so. Actually, what I discussed is a way of combining uh, trees inside a network. But uh, if we don't trust uh, our trees, but for example, some part of them, or if we don't want to consider all differences uh, in the tree, but only the most frequent one. So another way uh, to approach the problem is actually to extract um, the cluster set or the clades uh, from uh, this, uh, this tree, and then uh, keep, for example, the clades that have a high um, bootstrap value or the most frequent one, et cetera. And then, uh, and then when we filter this, uh, the, 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 the cluster, we, uh, we put the, the cluster set uh, into a network. And this is, uh, so it's, it's the, the cluster-based uh, method for, for a genetic uh, network reconstruction uh, uh, are doing that. And there, there are actually two ways of seeing a cluster inside a network. So there is the hardwired sense that is the same definition for tree. So we look at the leaves that are below a node, and this is the clade or the cluster of, uh, of the nodes. So here we can reach A and B and C. So the cluster of this node is ABC, and here we can reach CDE, and the, so the cluster is CD. But there is another way of seeing a cluster inside the uh, network is the software sense. So we do again the switch on, switch off uh, thing we saw in, uh, in the display tree. So what we do, so we uh, we switch on for each uh, of the reticulation one of the edge, and we switch the other off. And then uh, we look at which uh, label we can uh, uh, we can reach from the nodes. So here we can reach A and B and D. So again, the class is ABD. But on this side, we can't reach C anymore. So we have that the cluster is E and D. Then we switch that off and that on, and we do say we do the same thing. So in this case, we associate uh, A and B to this node and C, D, E to that node here. So you can see that this, uh, this uh, way of representing cluster containment is more compact and is giving a more compact uh, 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 genetic network. And this is why uh, actually is the, the way that uh, people now construct a, a cluster a cluster based network using a software that sends uh, containment. But the problem is again MP hard, APX hard, and even um, looking if uh, if a cluster is contained in a network, it's difficult. And so what what people did is to turn their attention to some restrained class of network. So for example, Gold Tree and Gold Network that we mentioned also by Luhai in. in talk and what I would like to, to, to mention is um, a cluster based method uh, that permit to construct level K network so network that have a level max uh, K so it's a uh, it's still an NPR problem but um, we have uh, an algorithm that is uh, is called the, the, the cast algorithm that I use often when I need to analyze some some data uh, from my uh, biological colleague uh, and uh, this problem is, uh, is ex uh, this agreement is exact for level one and level two network, and then it's a heuristic for the problem, but it works pretty well in, in practice. And uh, like the idea of the algorithm is that we start uh, with uh, a bunch of, uh, of cluster and we separate them in subset of cluster that uh, contain conflicts. And for each of the non-trivial subset of clusters, so subset that contain more than two cl uh, cluster, what we do is that we construct a, a network with the level max uh, k, so here for example, and then what we do is that we obtain cluster by um, taking all the label of the each subset of cluster. So here, the label in this subset of cluster is ABC. Here is a DFE, 
here is ABCD, etc., and go on. So with all this set of clusters here, we uh, construct uh, what we call a backbone tree. And what we do is that on this backbone tree, we are going to glue back together the small uh, network that we uh, uh, we construct previously. So one uh, after the other, and we get uh, a network that contain and display in a software sense uh, all uh, the the cluster that uh, we were in, we give in the input and as a, a level max uh, k. Maybe, maybe, maybe you could describe about level k networks a little bit. I mean, what? Could you describe bubble K networks a little bit? Bubble K, yeah. So, uh, so the idea is that uh, you you have uh, in uh, in a network you can have uh, what we call biconetic component that are a component where uh, each uh, node they they have two paths uh, to go to each other. So this is called a biconetic component. As as soon as uh, uh, as you have a biconetic component, you can count the number of uh, reticulation that are in this biconetic component, and this is the, the level. So a bubble K or level K uh, phylogenetic network is a, uh, is a network where you have at most K reticulation for each biconetic component. And the idea is that uh, they when the level is small, it means that uh, you are mixing up stuff in the network. They are not far away topologically because the uh, the mass we can see it's it's um, uh, it's restrained is constrained in a, in a by by connected component. I don't know if it, it, you want me to say more. No, that that, that definitely helps. Thanks. Okay. So uh, so now the CAS algorithm uh, was implemented by Stephen Kelkin uh, and Johan Hills, and now it's uh, it's inside the dendroscope. Uh, so uh, you can give dendroscope a bunch of trees, and it will ask you uh, which class you want to, to keep, and, uh, and then it will give you a, a level K uh, network out of, uh, uh, out of the, the algorithm. And it will start with level one, then we'll try level two, and so on. But we can also have uh, other um, combinatorial uh, objects that we would like to, uh, to, to put inside the network. So another possibility is to consider triplets, so a small uh, subtree on, uh, uh, on three leaves. So a triplet A and B means that A and B are, are together and then C is uh, it's outside. And uh, we, uh, uh, we can say that uh, a triplet is contained in a rooted phylogenetic network is if they exist the two nodes U and B, such that there exists a direct path from U uh, to V, uh, a direct path from U to C, and a two direct path from V to A and V to B. And all four paths have to be no disjoint again because of uh, like one allele per branches as uh, we uh, we had in the hybrid network model, and uh, there are like uh, softwares and algorithms uh, that have been uh, or um, that we produced by the team Leo Van Hilsen and Stephen Kelk. You can find uh, on, on the internet that they are ready to use. And uh, something else that I would like to, to mention in this first part of the talk is that uh, now people are start uh, using another approach that is uh, getting small uh, rooted uh, phylogenetic uh, network that they call a tree net, they are a network on a tree label, so uh, that one, and then uh, they, they put them together so it is a little bit the, the same idea as when we were doing a super tree out of, uh, of triplet, and now we can do super network uh, out of a uh, small network. And here again, uh, there is a, a tool that is available if you want to, to try if you have some tree net in your, in your drawer. And um, I, I g really gave you a, a, an idea, an overview of, uh, of uh, the, the rooted uh, uh, phylogenetic network versus structure in, in, uh, in the combinatorial point uh, of view, but there's a uh, lots of things that are, are, are going on. 
and also I haven't even mentioned the unrooted uh, tree, uh, the unrooted network, for example, the, the split network, uh, uh, etc. So I would just like to mention this uh, website that Philippe Gambet uh, created uh, several years ago, and then it's maintaining updated all the time. And uh, in one of the, the tool uh, that uh, this uh, website is giving you is the possibility of actually uh, seeing which software and algorithm are available for uh, a kind of uh, input data. So for example, if you have some uh, trees and you want to uh, to do phylogenetic networks out of tree, then you can just look uh, on the website and it will give you all the software with the, 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 like the URL where you find the software and uh, uh, the citation of the paper where the, the algorithm is explained. You can also uh, take this graph and uh, filter uh, for getting only the, the, uh, the software that has been used more than X uh, time. So it's really, really a powerful tool and uh, I would really strongly suggest you to have a look if you are really interested in, um, in reconstructive phylogenetic network and what I discuss uh, uh, today does not suit you. So this is the conclusion of the, like, the first part of the talk. So in the second part of the talk, I'm going to, to discuss uh, sequence-based uh, parsimony method in uh, phylogenetic network reconstruction. So the first thing I'll do is to actually start reviewing the sequence-based uh, parsimony method for trees. And their main hypothesis is that character changes are not frequent. And so the phylogeny that explain the, the, the data best are those requiring the fewest evolutionary changes. So uh, if we have an alignment, uh, what we do uh, is that uh, we consider that uh, each side evolved independently. So we consider each uh, column of the alignment uh, independently. We can also weight them if we have a more confidence on one side uh, and not on the other. And uh, what we call the small parsimony problem consists in, in scoring uh, a tree. Uh, it's a given tree, given an assignment of, uh, of uh, the leaves. Uh, by searching the assignment uh, of the internal nodes that minimize the number of branches that have a different state at extremity. And the number of branches that have a different state at extremity is actually the parsimony score of the tree. Here, the parsimony score is two. And uh, when we are not given the tree, then we have the big parsimony problem that consists in looking for the tree with the minimum uh, parsimony uh, score and this problem is, uh, is uh, MPR. And uh, so in, in the last decades uh, there has been some work uh, toward the generalization of uh, this kind of method of, to phylogenetic network uh, reconstruction and Luai said in this uh, talk that, uh, yeah, the parsimony uh, method, they are not model-based, uh, they, uh, they are less powerful than the uh, likelihood-based one, and they are not statistically consistent, so they have, uh, like, uh, there are some issues with this problem. But I still think that this method has a very important role to play in uh, phylogenetic network extraction, because, first of all, it can be used in combination with the likelihood-based method. So, for example, we can use parsimony method to, to have a network which, which start the maximum likelihood search, or we can use, uh, uh, use them to design fast local search techniques. So, for example, we can uh, score with a parsimony score a bunch of network and then decide which net we, uh, we want to score with the likelihood, uh, in a likelihood framework by, by using the, uh, the parsimony score. And obviously, they will be very useful in the case where the likelihood based method they just don't scale up. So, as soon as they don't scale up, uh, at least we have a, a method that they scale up and give you some ideas. If, even if it's not, um, uh, if it's not statistically consistent. And the strategy is the, the same strategy that uh, Luhai discussed in, the, in this talk. So we start uh, with a bunch of alignment, and then we have some horizontal move in the space of three, so the reticulation uh, zero network. Uh, so we go around with, uh, 
with RNI uh, RSPR that has been uh, recently uh, formally introduced for, uh, for for network. And then from time to time, we may want to do what we call um, a vertical move, so a complexity changing uh, move, uh, so moving in another, another tier of uh, of a network, so reticulation one networks, for example. And uh, we can use uh, techniques such as uh, the ICU by BC uh, criteria or uh, cross validation, and we can do it uh, as, as soon as uh, and as soon as we we got uh, a network that is satisfying for us, uh, we stop. So what I will do in the second part of the talk is uh, to explain how to score uh, a network um, in a in a parsimony way uh, in uh, to be used in. Um, in a strategy that I, I just described. So the, the first uh, way of scoring a network may be to use exactly the same definition uh, that uh, uh, was used for tree. So to find the assignment of the state to internal nodes of the network such that the total number of edges that connect nodes in a different state is minimized. So this is, uh, uh, is the mathematical form or formula for that. And this is exactly the same definition that we used uh, for tree. So here, yeah, you see that this is one and two. So the hardware parsimony score of, of this is uh, is two. And it, it, this has been conjectured to be NPR in the Samuel paper of Cannon and Wheeler. And uh, we actually prove that uh, the problem is NPR and IPC, uh, RPX hard whenever we have uh, more than two states used uh, in the column. Uh, but the problem is fixed parameter tractable in the parsimony score. So if the parsimony score is, is, uh, is low, that uh, we have a good running time. And we can also have a good approximation algorithm. And it's also worth mentioning that we have a polynomial algorithm for binary characters. So if you have zero, one character, then you can uh, use a polynomial algorithm to score your, your network. But the problem of uh, this formulation is not the fact that it's, uh, it's hard, is that uh, it may, from time to time, count more state changes than uh, necessary. So for example, here we have an example. If we have uh, an hybridization node uh, that has state zero, and one of the parent has state one, and one of the parent has state uh, zero, uh, in a high uh, hardware per series score, we will count one uh, change, uh, one state change. Now, uh, H could very well have inherited his state from uh, the, his same state parent. So from time to time, we count more state changes than uh, necessary. And this is why um, probably the software parsimony score is uh, more uh, biologically relevant. And this score, it's, it's very easy to, um, to describe. So what we do is uh, we, uh, we compute the, the minimum of the parsimony score over all trees that are displayed uh, oh, displayed uh, by the network. Why I'm going backward? So here is uh, the the set of uh, trees displayed by the network is uh, it's uh, B tau of n. So what we do is uh, uh, this is uh, the definition of uh, of parsimony score for a tree, and we minimize over all trees displayed by by the network, and. Um, this problem again is NPR, the difficult to, to to approximate. So it's NPR also for uh, for network they are pretty tree-like, and also when the, the character are binary, so it's really uh, uh, bad. And it's also not FPT in the parsimony score because it's NPR to to uh, know if the parsimony score is equal to one. But on the positive uh, side, we have that is FPT in the level of the network. So as soon as the ne level of the network is low, uh, we have a good running time. And we also have a fast ILP formulation. ILP is an uh, integer linear programming formulation. And we did simulation uh, always on my old computer. And uh, like the formulation is pretty fast. So we have a way of uh, scoring uh, a network in the software parsimony way uh, fast. But also, this uh, scoring function has uh, its issue. Uh, first of all, we will see it does not account for uh, ILS uh, and allopolyploidy, and has uh, some identifiability issue. So the identifiability issue comes from the fact that we are minimizing over all uh, possible trees uh, displayed by the network. But 
is now known that there are different networks that uh, can display the same tree. So for example, N1 here and N2 here, they display this uh, two, three tree uh, below. And so we can add as much data uh, as, as we want. We will always have the same score for N1 and N2. So this is what we call IDT viability problem. So the N1 and N2, they are not identifiable, no matter the input data. And this stays also when we add branch lengths and inheritance probability to the model. So it's not the problem of, uh, of the parsimony uh, scoring function, it's, it's the problem of the fact that we focus on displayed tree. So as soon as we score uh, over display tree, then we will get uh, this problem. So it can be an ML or Bayesian approach will stay the same. So the, the question now we can ask ourselves is, are actually the gene tree always displayed by the network? So here there is a cartoon of a, a currently accepted integration scenario uh, among you, uh, modern human. And here we have uh, the mitochondrial uh, genome phylogenetic tree, and uh, we draw it uh, inside. And here you see, you can see that actually the tree is not uh, is not displayed by by the network. We have a two allele here in this uh, in this branch, and uh, this is something that uh, happen uh, also when we have uh, actually species tree. So when as soon as we have a, a incomplete lineage sorting in our population. Uh, we can have uh, several allele uh, in, uh, that uh, goes uh, uh, that survive the speciation, and then we can have that the gene tree are different from from the species tree. So that happened uh, to when uh, the species network is uh, is a tree, and yeah, it happened also when the species network is actually a network. So here an example when we have uh, ILS at the at the moment of the, uh, the hybridization. So we may have an allele coming from, uh, from the parents on the left, an allele coming from, uh, from the, la uh, the, the right. And you can see that here the true gene tree is not displayed by the network because we are using both edges that are entering the hybrid node. And if you remember, we had to switch on, switch off stuff. And so we actually can use only one edge that enter uh, the hybrid node at a time. And this also um, create a problem for uh, modeling like allopolyploidy when you, you have that uh, like the, the two uh, the the two genes are inherited by uh, by here the the hybrid species, and uh, so again if we look at the, the gene tree inside this gene tree is not displayed because again the network uh, does not allow to use uh, both edges when we are in a displayed uh, tree uh, model. And so to go forward and uh, move uh, um, away from this display tree model, uh, I need to introduce uh, another concept that is uh, the concept of multi-label tree U star. So I put uh, actually the like the mathematical formal definition. If you are interested, if you would like to pause me and look at what uh, the formula is saying, but uh, roughly speaking, the idea is that. Uh, the uh, U-star N uh, multi-label tree is an unfolding of the network that contain all possible paths from the root uh, to the leaf. So for example, to go uh, here, to, to, to go to the cherry uh, CD, we have either this path here or this path here, you see? And uh, using so this multi-label tree that is multi-label because you see there are several times the same label, we can define uh, the concept of a parental tree. So uh, a parental tree is a tree that is displayed by this unfolding uh, of, uh, of the network. And uh, they all also have been called weekly displayed tree in, uh, in uh, an, another publication. And um, our two examples of allopolyploidy uh, and uh, ILS uh, in the hybrid speciation, uh, they are actually a parental tree uh, of, uh, of uh, our, our network. So, and I would also like to mention that, yeah, parental trees can also be multi labeled so you can have uh, like several individual per, uh, per, uh, per species, and you have the same, uh, the same definition. 
So yeah, I, probably it's not surprising for you. So what I would like to uh, uh, to introduce is uh, the parental posterior score that is uh, defined uh, as the the software parsimony score, but here we don't uh, minimize over the display tree, but we minimize over the parental uh, trees. So uh, this is an example. So uh, we have a, a network, it's always the same. And so if you want to score it uh, in, in a hard white sense, we are we're getting a score of two. And if you score it in a software sense, since you have only two, uh, um, display tree that needed two changes each, then you will all, uh, also give a score of two. And if you score it in a, in a parental way, then you have that one of the parental tree uh, as, a, as a score uh, of one. And it's like it's the three scores are, are very different. They can be like uh, uh, we show that, for example, the hardware reporting score can be as far as, uh, as we want from the software passing score. And um, something I would also like to, to, to mention is that uh, actually this concept of, uh, uh, of parental tree, we, we haven't invented. And this actually has been used by Dagnan and his co-author to prove that um, this parental tree, they can actually uh, solve the identifiability problem in lots of uh, practical cases. So when we move uh, away from the, the display tree, we are going to have less identifiability issues. So I uh, just wanted to mention that. So uh, we uh, studied uh, this uh, parental procedure score uh, from a complexity point of view, and uh, again, uh, we, we get uh, NPR the result for uh, pretty tree-like uh, network and binary character. But uh, in, that case, in this case, we have that, again, uh, the, the problem is FPT in the reticulation number and in the level of, uh, uh, of the network. And uh, to prove that, we used what we call the lineage function, that it's uh, just a, a function that map each node uh, of, of a network into a set of states. So it's, it's a way of tracking how many branches uh, of, uh, of the parental tree uh, travel through uh, each node of the network and what state are assigned to each of those branches. So for example, here we have uh, one, uh, one branch that uh, has a state uh, uh, zero, another branch going through that has a state one, and another branch going that has a state two. And this is why we get uh, this uh, lineage function of zero, one, and two. And uh, so uh, I would just like to, 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 to mention this, uh, like to walk through this dynamic program algorithm because uh, I, it's actually like highly functional, as you will see in the last slide. So it's just a dynamic programming algorithm with uh, a guessing phase. So we start uh, with the binary network and we have states that are assigned uh, to, to the leaves. So uh, we see how many states we have. So here we have uh, state one and state two. So our P is equal to two. So we have a binary state. And then we have this uh, Y that is uh, the set of all possible states for an internal node uh, of N. So our state, uh, our nodes, they can have state uh, one or state two or one two if we have they have uh, both uh, allele. And then uh, the the algorithm delete a random parent uh, like get a random parent for each reticulation node. So now here we have only one reticulation node, and we are getting, for example, p equal uh, uh, before, and we delete all. Uh, outgoing edges of, uh, um, of uh, before, and uh, we decompose the problem in several subtrees that we analyze uh, separately, and then we put them uh, uh, together. And then what we have is this guessing phase. Uh, so the, in the guessing phase, what we do is to uh, we analyze, uh, uh, we loop over all possible state for uh, the, the node in P, so before in, the, in this example. So we'll start uh, with the uh, before having state one, then we we'll move to before having state two, and before having state uh, one and two. So we'll uh, loop uh, over all possibility. And what we do is just like to fill uh, a cost matrix where we have the cost matrix H U S, where U is here and S is here, and where we put this so in U uh, H U S, we put the cost uh, of having U at state S. 
So for like for leaves uh, and before, since the, the, they are associated to, to a state, they are given a state, then it's easy. If the state S is equal to the state uh, that is associated to the node, then the cost is zero, otherwise uh, is, uh, is infinite. So this is what we are doing. So before it's associated to one, so the cost of associating to, 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 to one is zero and the other are infinite. So for example, we look at V9, the cost of associated V9 to two is zero and the other are infinite. And then we move uh, to uh, eternal nodes that have, uh, have two children. And uh, in that case, the cost of associating U to S is the minimum over all state assignment S1 for the first child V1 of uh, U of the cost of associated V1 to S1 plus the cost of changing from S1 in V1 to uh, S in, in U, plus the same for, for the second child. And this cost is, is, is like ugly to see, but easy to, to understand. So if we are, if we are the, the, the root, we have zero because we have no father, so it does not cost anything because we have no father. And uh, suppose that V as a state uh, uh, as prime and U uh, as state S, so if V has uh, more lineages than uh, um, its parents, we give uh, uh, infinite cost. So this is because uh, in this model, we have that the lineage have to go forward in time and they can't appear from nowhere. So lineage in V has to pass uh, through one of the parents in V. So this is why we give infinite if we have more lineage than the sum of its parts. Otherwise, the cost is just the number of states in S prime that are not in the parents. So just the case of, a, of an evolutionary changes. So we do that for, uh, for, uh, for the nodes. So the same uh, is for the internal node with the one child. It's the same, but only one child. If we go, go on uh, in a bottom-up fashion. And uh, uh, as soon as uh, we have finished uh, filling uh, uh, the, the metrics for all the, all the nodes, uh, we have to glue uh, back the network and uh, we compute uh, the, the overall cost. And this overall cost is the, the cost of having, uh, uh, the minimum cost of having one allele at the root, because in this uh, model we start with one allele. So the root is associated with uh, a single state, so either one or two in this example. So this is why we minimize here. Plus the cost of reattaching uh, all this uh, subtree that we were, they were floating uh, around. And we do that, so this in this case is one plus one. So we do it for all uh, possible way of assigning to uh, the reticulation, uh, the, the, the parents of the reticulation we had in uh, P. So here we had only uh, uh, V4, so we, we try V4 equal 1, we try V4 equal 2, and we try V4 uh, 1 and 2, and then we get the minimum of this. And once we have uh, actually this, the, the, best, um, the best solution, we can do like a backtracking of our dynamic uh, programming uh, table and we can get the information on the, the lineage and then uh, transform it in a representation that is more readable uh, uh, by biology that is that this branch is going on uh, inside the, uh, the network. And the, the, the running time is uh, exponential in the, in the number of reticulation. It also depends on the number of possible state. So this, like for binary state, this is why it's three. If we have uh, like four state, it's 15. So yeah, I don't think it will work for protein, for example. And we can actually uh, change the algorithm for having a running time that depends on, on the level and not uh, on the uh, on, uh, on the hybridization uh, number, and this we can do that uh, by uh, considering uh, each uh, biconetic component uh, at the time uh, in a, a bottom-up fashion, and uh, and then once that uh, one biconetic component has been uh, uh, worked on, then we can consider it as a leaf, and we can continue. So and this gives you a, a running time that is exponential in L and not in R. And the nice thing of this algorithm is, is like it's, 
give you the possibility also like to consider multiple individual species so they can have uh, all different alleles so for example b has a little uh, a zero one and two we can have like uh, repeated uh, allele and we can actually use the same uh, algorithm but with a small modification to uh, to compute the software presuming score by just uh, uh, not taking all the possible uh, set of state but all the set of state they contain a single state so one and two are possible but not uh, um, uh, one two because uh, uh, if you remember the software persimony, you have one allele per branches. Then we can also change it to have the hardware persimony score to be computed. Again, this is very easy. We just consider the set of uh, all set containing a single state, and we can't consider the empty set because uh, in the hardware persimony score, we have uh, that every node is assigned to a state. This is why we can count uh, uh, changes several times. And then we can also we also have to change the weight uh, accordingly. And then we can also we can change the cost in other way, moving away from the parental trees, so trying to minimize duplication and loss in ILS. So it's all, all it's is uh, is explained in the uh, in the paper is is really like this lineage function. It's like a meta algorithm that permits you to minimize uh, uh, a lot of things. So uh, for concluding, I I hope that I um, I, I managed to convince you that parsimony methods are getting more and more biologically relevant, and since they they scale up uh, to to big uh, data that often they cannot be analyzed with the ML Bayesian approach, uh, they can be useful. And even if the Bayesian ML approach uh, scale up, we can still uh, use. Uh, uh, this kind of method uh, in combination with them. So I really would like to thank Eric for the invitation and uh, you for your attention. So that's all. Thank you very much, Celine. That was an awesome cruise through the world of uh, biogenetic networks. So if anybody has any questions, definitely post them on IRC or, or at File Seminar on Twitter. Um, I guess, I mean, I'm curious, for instance, I mean, it's, there's so many things that seem like, oh, that shouldn't be too hard, but of course it's NP hard. Um, like, I'm just sort of curious, like when you're, when you're working with these approximation algorithms, when you, when you, if you do simulation, uh, how close, I mean, you have this three approximation that you mentioned at the beginning uh, for the, uh, hybridization network problem and is that I mean in simulation how close is that to being a, a full solution uh, so uh, what we so we had the we had the simulation in two settings so the first setting is uh, exact solution for the agreement force and exact solution yep. for the, the DFBS. Mm -hmm. So it gives a true approximation. And we did a lot of simulation. It was more like, a, if I remember correctly, like a 1.01 approximation. Oh. So it, it really, really good. And then we did the same for, um, for the four approximation. It was uh, more like a true approximation in uh, our simulation. And then, um, and when you start uh, doing like the uh, the, the non-binary approximation, that is this D uh, uh, D uh, C plus uh, uh, plus three, then you we got uh, uh, like six approximation. Then you start being a little bit far from the, the solution. But the, like the, the the two approximation and the four approximation are really good. Nice. I mean, I guess a similar question is empirically, what is the level of the of networks in nature? I know that that's sort of like an impossible question, but like, no, it's not impossible. It's actually something that I'm like I'm really curious of, and uh, um, it's something that I I, I will like I'm, I'm working on right now because there's this paper uh, of Tanya that uh, gives uh, like uh, an idea of uh, and prior on this piece of network. So I wanted to, to do some, some simulation uh, to, to get some network uh, out of uh, the simulator and see what is the level. And uh, there are also other parameters that we, we work on. Uh, for example, the tree weights. Uh, 
it's a, it's a parameter that is uh, lots of people of FPT community loves, and it's actually something that is, is coming out uh, often in the last work we, we have done uh, with colleagues. And this, uh, some, so there are lots of parameters that I would like to test. Uh, so it's, it's actually something that uh, I would do as, as soon as I find some time, like to simulate the uh, uh, network and to compute the parameters for the network to see which is the best parameters for our algorithm. Right. I mean, I guess ideally you'd be able to compute, like, say, under the simulation conditions, this is the distribution of the level of the. Yeah. Um, I didn't really follow the objective function of the trinet. Thing. I mean, it seems like there's two potential things that you want to minimize. It's like extra edges, but also how many of those triples get displayed in the in the final network? Or yeah, if I remember correctly, uh, this algorithm is uh, it requires that all the the, the tree nets are are displayed. Okay. okay. So, a lot of these algorithms, like tree nets and, and triplets, they are actually asking that all the, the the triplets are there because you are actually you can filter before, so uh, you can filter out and all, only get the one that are uh, often there, very frequent, and then uh, you really want them to be in the network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a little bit different than than like quartet algorithms and things like that, I guess, but. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 different because yeah, you you often uh, uh, so I think they started in in the, in the same way and then uh, they diverge. So uh, they, yeah, you, you before you wanted to have all all, all of them, but uh, then you you have a yes or no solution because uh, the difference with the the quartet uh, method or triplet method for trees is. Uh, if there is some uh, conflict, then the answer is no. So, for example, the how algorithm for uh, for triplets, as soon as you have uh, conflict, is no. So, you cannot do anything else than uh, like not put them all together in the tree. But here in in the network, you have two choices: either you drop some of uh, of your combinatorial object, or you rise the complexity of the network to fit all your combinatorial object together. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, don't, I mean, this is sort of a crazy qu idea, but uh, I mean, I, I really like your idea of using parsimony methods as sort of a way of exploring the space of networks that you might want to check out later using a likelihood-based function. But I wonder if... If that was your explicit goal and you forgot about any inherent notions that we had of parsimony already, is there something that one could do that would be like in between classical parsimony and likelihood methods? Like, uh, a, like a relaxation, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, is there something that you can do that's a little bit closer to parsimony, but still keeps some sort of discrete character. So I think one thing that like that I would do is maybe is to play with the weights because I think that the the weights in the can give you some uh, some power, uh, like weighting the the. And then uh, you can. So these are weights on what? So there are the weights. Uh, there are two weights. So the weights on uh, between the columns and uh, the weights between like the, the having a, a, a matrix of, of, of state changes. So not making, uh, for example, a a going to t uh, being the same that a going. You, you know. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing. So it's so you're saying that you can. So you can work on these weighted versions of parsimony. Yeah, you can do that. And also something that that he like we are working on, but this is really really super complex. Is trying to 
avoid to, to have uh, each site in, independently because uh, in, in the network it really makes no sense that you move from one side to the other and you switch completely the tree inside the network all the time. So, that was actually going to be exactly my next question. Is like, yeah, yeah I mean, you're, if you're looking for re no recombination blocks or something like that, then that's yeah, yeah. So it's it's something like uh, we work on. It's just it takes it takes time, and there are lots of lots of uh, work that have been done already, heuristic and things. So we are uh, we are trying to um, uh, to give more like formal definition of, of this problem. Trying to. Uh, to find a way to get something that is mathematically correct but uh, stay uh, reasonably uh, fast for uh, for decomposing. But yeah, yes, there's a lot of things going on for finding like uh, recombination, non-recombination blocks, and then you can just uh, force the whole uh, non-recombination block to uh, to be uh, this. In the, the same tree, the same display tree, the same uh, uh, parental tree, and, and you won't go. Yeah, yeah that sounds really neat and, and totally important. Uh, I mean, for viruses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, no, no, I agree. It's, uh, otherwise, this it's not going to be meaningful. But yeah, one step at a time. But the, uh, I agree with you that otherwise, it, it, if you apply um, like a single site. Uh, or see many method, you will have like unrealistic results. Um, one just uh, other detail sort of thing. I didn't really follow the parental identifiability thing that you said that James Dignan and somebody else worked out. That it sounded like you were saying that there's sort of a partial identifiability. So what they proved is that um, uh, you can have a network then they are not identifiable uh, when you look at the display tree but they can be identifiable uh, when they look at the parental trees and so they are always identifiable if you're looking at this parental so they proved that uh, uh, that uh, there there are cases of a non identifiability and played a model that are solved in, in the parental model, but I don't think they, they proved that uh, like you can have, still have a, a problem of uh, identifiability for uh, for the parental tree model, but it's okay. way, way rarer hmm. than this. Like the display, the display uh, the tree uh, identifiability issue when you don't have branch lengths and inheritance probability can be a really serious problem. We saw it on some simulation. Like you get it all the time. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting, different notion of identifiability than I'm used to. Because to be clear, I mean, these, this is like if you these trees are the right trees, you can't you can't get at the network still. So uh, yeah, it's, it's so our your identifiability was uh, uh, you you can get. Uh, you can put as much data as uh, as you want. Uh, you will never recover the good network, right? Because you have uh, several of them. You can have like thousand, and then you can't recover it. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think our time is up. But um, like I say, that was a really great spin through network world. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Bye.